So welcome everybody. Um, so glad that you are joining us for this conversation on the rise of gender capitalism. I'm Jackie Vanderbrug. I'm with US Trust Bank of America. And I have to say, um, I am thrilled we are having this conversation. Uh, I am thrilled to be back here at SOCAP. Uh, in some sense, where this conversation was born about five years ago, at least born for me. And a couple of years ago, as many of you know, we had a, a broader track around gender. Um, and this year, there's a whole series of panels, um, started yesterday by Jennifer John, and continuing after this panel and uh, in another conversation. So I encourage you um, to join in, in in any and all of those. Actually, to that extent, how many people were there in the conversation yesterday? Just curious. OK, so we're half, half, something like that. So we'll pick up from that. And hopefully, those of you who weren't there aren't going to feel too far left behind. We'll try and move pretty quickly. Um, the way we're going to structure this panel is in four quarters. So we're going to talk first about the external market opportunity that we see. Secondly, the internal aspect of how this is occurring in organizations and what is changing. And then lastly, about what does this mean personally for all of us as leaders? Um, and then the last quarter, the most important, will be a conversation with you all. So hopefully we'll move through that rather quickly. Um, I want to say two things, though, at a start which is, first of all, um, this conversation is increasingly present in our society and in the media, which I think is fabulous. In, uh, at some level, you have to be living under a rock to not see something around gender or women in finance. The challenge that I feel is that oftentimes that conversation is about the gap. It's about what's missing. It's about what isn't happening. And it stops there. It doesn't necessarily get to that process of saying, how do we get beyond that to insights and implementation? And so hopefully, um, the four of us here today will give you some experience, some, some stories from the front lines in terms of organizations that are actually using a gender lens to change things. Um, Jen said this yesterday. I want to reemphasize. We're using gender by choice. We're talking about. Um, gender as a socially constructed aspect, as something that changes over time, as something that's different in different regions, but also because it brings men into the conversation. Um, we are on a gender diverse panel, and I'm thrilled about that. I will also say about my panelists um, that you will notice that Patience Marem Ball is not here, unfortunately, and Kristen um, Darcy has joined us. Um, I'm sorry, Kristen Dacey has joined us. Be careful who you have breakfast with, because I had breakfast with her and said, hey, wait a second, you should jump in, because the IFC can't be here. And we don't have Jen Price, but Justin is um, stepping in and has all of the same experiences and stories and everything else. So we're off to the races. Um, the one other piece of context uh, is as we talk about gender, and, and we specifically titled this gender capitalism um, somewhat as a, a shameless promotion for an article that is in this month's Stanford Social Innovation Review. So if you haven't seen it, we have copies here. Please take them. Please go over to the main um, area and sign up for their mailing list for their e-pieces. It is one of the best journals in our generic space here. Um, but. <laughs> Gender capitalism is really looking to bridge this aspect, to say, where is gender relevant to finance, and where is finance relevant to gender, going back and forth. And to get away from that artificial divide that I think has existed, which is to say, investors have said, well, I don't want to be too pink. I don't want to be too gender focused. That would be seen as soft. And traditional women's organizations, have said, oh, I don't know if I want to get too into that capitalism piece. I might sell out. And gender capitalism is really saying, let's, let's create a bridge. Because this is a powerful way to create increased returns, to create increased impact, and quite frankly, to make a world that works for all of us. OK, so with that, um, my fabulous uh, panelists here, 
Ross Baird from Village Capital, Justin Conway from the Calvert Foundation, and Kristen Dicey, as I said, from um, the Inter-American Development Bank. Um, let's level set around the market here and this external piece. Why are each of you involved in this? Why did you choose to have uh, gender sensitivity in your work? The, um, the IFC and McKinsey have done a study. If you haven't seen it, they, they pegged the global credit gap for women entrepreneurs between 260 and $320 billion. Billion with a B. <laughs> um, and that is driving a market case broadly speaking, that you're seeing organizations like the IFC and IDB jump into. But Kristen, from your perspective, why is gender relevant and how is it relevant at the IFC, uh, at IDB, sorry. So. Ah, yes. I, I think they'll turn it on for you, hang on. Okay, sorry. So IDB has done studies that gender is crucial for competitive innovation um, of companies and also for poverty reduction. That women globally control 80% of the spending power um, globally, and that is true for Latin America as well. That they make the final decision on 91% of home purchases, 65% of new car purchases, 80% of healthcare and 60% of computers. That women in the global place are a critical part of competitiveness and also a critical part of development and helping people move out of poverty. For us, that, that was a critical reason and in being involved in this area, having the, the focus. Additionally, we, we've done work with corporate governance in looking at the, the boards and the management team of companies and that companies that have a greater percentage of women as part of the board, as part of the management team, are more competitive. We did a, a study with Deloitte um, where companies with a, a diverse leadership team with a significant percentage of women are more innovative and also generate higher financial returns. So for, for us, it really is the, the, the business sense and the developmental impact. So those are great statistics, and it, it really does get to, it, it is partially about women entrepreneurs and access to capital, but clearly not exclusively, because you went much broader in terms of the value chain of a company. How accepted is that as you talk to your partners and your clients, some of whom are large banks or, or throughout Latin America, what's the response, and, and are they seeing the same market opportunity that you're seeing? Uh, some of it has been an iterative process in, in speaking with um, some of the various banks. Our, our organization covers several different markets and entities. We work with banks and financial markets. We work with corporates and agribusiness and in various um, areas of energy efficiency. We do large infrastructure projects. And a lot of it has been bringing data to the table to help educate them both on corporate governance as well on the, the actual business practice that, that a huge portion of the, the consumers, the users of the products and services are women and having women help design them on the board making decisions is important. So it has been an iterative process in going through showing them the data and working with them. Um, part of that has also been a, a self-reflecting at, at, at IDB that we have been focusing on trying to increase women's involvement in managerial roles and our recruiting and our hiring and educating all of our frontline people and investment officers that sometimes having a conversation where a client may come to us saying, we're looking to expand this factory. Can you help finance it? And in that, discovering ways that we can create shared value and working with them both to expand their business, but to do it in a smarter way, taking into account gender perspective. That's great. We'll pick up on the internal piece also, because that's a conversation that I think a lot of us are having. But um, Justin, how about the Calvert Foundation? I, I just have to say my hat is always off to the Calvert Foundation for their leadership in this space and for being in some sense a, one of the first movers in the impact space to really create a product that had a, an explicit gender lens. But one, why? And then, you know, what did you learn about the market for that? 
Sure. Well, first, I want to say thanks to, to Jackie for, for her leadership really in, in this space. I think uh, all of us uh, in our organizations and certainly others here and more broadly in our industry really have learned a lot from you and in, in, in your leadership and um, inspired others to, to really make this more a part of our, our understanding and decision making. So hats off. Uh, so at, at Calvert Foundation, our, our focus has really been around uh, helping people invest in the places and, and causes that they, they care about, really around poverty alleviation. And we've certainly seen over the, the last 20 years about how investing in women, uh, especially internationally from in microfinance and other sectors, has been uh, an important poverty a- intervention. And so. We uh, started to think certainly from some of the the work that was coming out from folks like Criterion and all about uh, ways that we could really expand upon that um, and and take it not just in the sector of microfinance and some others that we've seen, but try to do something especially domestically, which is a real challenge for us. People had started to ask us how can we invest with a gender lens and the the way we were really showing people was how there are microfinance institutions that are predominantly serving women. And we thought about how can we make this more a part of the the conversation in other sectors we work with, especially domestically. And so that was really our uh, impact challenge to ourselves to see whether we could create a portfolio uh, that would uh, be at least 70% uh, domestic in in the U.S. and um, serving uh, women. Uh, And we got to 80%. And when we look at how we came up with, uh, how we thought about this and came up with our our win-win initiative was really going out there and looking for uh, organizations and enterprises that met three criteria, uh, that they had uh, products and, and services and programs that were uh, beneficial programs and products uh, for women. Uh, that was one that they had internalized this themselves and so that women were involved in the decision making. They had representation from women at the management level, uh, at the board level as well. And that they were also able to commit to uh, work with us and try to measure this and understand this more, uh, that this is a, an ongoing understanding and conversation that we're, we're all part of. And so uh, would they be willing to uh, c- continue to report on these metrics, get better at them, and just figure out how we can all work together so that we can understand increasing opportunities uh, by investing this way? Mm-hmm. So as you put this product together and you were able to create this aspect of to get to 80%, what was the reaction from your customers? Were they interested? Yeah, so uh, historically, uh, I think one of the perceptions, um, and there's data to to back this up, is that women are more inclined to be interested in impact investing. And from our experience over 20 years, that certainly is the case. Uh, We we work with uh, thousands of of investors, and 60% of them are, are, are women. And so we thought that when we launched a a women's initiative, because we knew that there was demand for product in in the field, that we would get more women. Uh, Our our women's initiative is called Win-Win, Women Investing in Women (laughs) Initiative. Uh, We don't need any more acronyms in in, in our industry, that's for sure, but that's a a mouthful, so Win-Win seemed to work. But in that uh, title, Women Investing in Women, is the assumption that women would be investing in women. And what we actually found uh, was that uh, the investors were actually pretty evenly split, uh, men and women. So I hope some of our supporters who kind of really wanted to just make it a women's thing uh, aren't in the room uh, here today. But I think it's really good news that both men and women uh, see this as an opportunity. Uh, We're helping channel uh, capital to enterprises uh, serving and empowering uh, women and girls. So that was uh, certainly one of the the, the real learnings from this, that they're um, both were involved. Mm -hmm. Um, And overall, we saw just broader engagement from newer audiences, whether they were investors who had never thought about impact investing before, but somehow investing with a gender lens or, or in women uh, seemed to bring them to the conversation. We saw folks that we knew for a while, whether it's financial advisors or some institutional investors, uh, looking to us in, in, in other ways. Um, and and they, the gamut really ranged from individuals to mutual funds like Calvert and Pax uh, getting involved in, um, through us and, and in other ways. And so it was exciting to see that. And what I would say is is that you know, it's not just us. Folks are looking to go deeper, looking for new products and, and strategies in the space to continue to move this forward. Mm, thanks. And Ross, so 
Village Capital did not start out with a gender strategy at all, right? It wasn't, wow, we see a market for women social entrepreneurs. But somehow your process has emerged and some of your, your research. So, so tell us about that. Yeah, thanks. And uh, I just want to echo, Jackie, what Justin said. I think that um, we're having a very intentional, deliberate, and really productive and I think profitable conversation that you've really um, been at the forefront of leading for uh, five years and probably longer. But I met you five years ago. And it's just I, your, your leadership, is it's, it's a joy to be working with you. Um, so... Uh, Village Capital, the organization I run, uh, we gather entrepreneurs for, pick your favorite term, incubator-like programs where we provide business assistance to entrepreneurs. We have an uh, investment fund that invests in the graduates. And the thing that we do differently is it's all peer selection. So groups of entrepreneurs are essentially the investment committee for the fund. Um, this is... Uh, we didn't set out to be a gender organization, but uh, what we have found, we have 450 alumni of our programs. Uh, what we have found in the most recent, uh, Emory University manages our data. They do a download every six months. And in the most recent study, we found that controlling for similar industries, geographies, et cetera, women co-founded businesses are earning 20% more revenue than uh, their peers who are men co-founded businesses, they are also uh, reaching, they are also only raising 80% as much uh, compared to their fundraising targets as men co-founded businesses. And I think that is across uh, not just our companies, but companies who applied to our program and didn't get in. That's 1,500 data points. So um, it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty substantial evidence. What it means is how many of you um, either personally or professionally or both um, have an investment in a venture capital or private equity fund. Probably everybody in the room who has a retirement plan is in that bucket, even if you don't actively go out and invest. Um, what that means is uh, your money is very, very likely being deployed in a process that is systematically undervaluing businesses that we have evidence are at least as profitable, if not more. And if I came to you and brought women out of the country, but said brought women out of the conversation, but said your fund managers are actively, maybe unintentionally, but actively choosing less profitable businesses, you would say, "Fire the bums! It's terrible." <laughs> um, but so the peer selection process we designed, we didn't, it wasn't a gender strategy. It was a strategy to remove the implicit biases that investors have all the time when they make decisions. You know, I went to the same university as this person, you know, our sons go to the same high school, like stuff, stuff that really doesn't matter, uh, but drives investment decision making all the time. And removing that, democratizing the investment process um, has been really, really effective for women. So for example, 25% um, of our participants in our accelerator programs are women. Uh, we, uh, the average technology accelerator program has about 8% women across the board. So we, I mean, we try and actively oversample 40% of the companies that have gotten funding through this process are women co-founded. Um, and it's it's, uh, and talking to our women entrepreneurs who've gotten investment, they, we hear some version of, I felt, like got a, I felt like I got a much fairer shot in the peer review than I ever feel like I get pitching any number of funds. So I think calling out and identifying the biases that happen in day-to-day -day investing that are working against businesses that are outperforming is, is how we got here. Mm, that's great. And I, I think to just underline some of what we found fascinating, Sarah Kaplan and I wrote this article in terms of Ross's process is it wasn't assuming that the, the women needed fixing, right? That, that we just need to have women pitch better. It was saying, let's look at the system. Let's look at the process and see, is there a place where the process maybe isn't making the best decision? And in some sense, what Village Capital is saying is, wait, there's a market opportunity here because the market is not correctly valuing. The market doesn't have perfect information. Um, I'll also tip my hat to PAX or, uh, over there and, and say PAX World has been a leader in the public markets in this space and has just launched a global um, women's equality index with Elevate. They're asking the same questions in the public markets 
And uh, I work at US Trust, we have a women and girls equality strategy, again, investing in public companies that we believe are thoughtful about how they engage women as consumers, as Kristen was saying, as employees, and as agents of global change. And personally, I think that the companies who are not doing that are going to have trouble long-term because one, they're not gonna win the war for talent, right? If we look at the business case and say, women are over 50% of the graduates, undergraduate, masters, PhD now, what's the war for talent look like? If we look at design and women being in the consumer seat, et cetera, et cetera. So just to say, we're talking here mostly about private investments, um, but this is a conversation that is happening across the board, and it's not happening as a values-based way to lose money, right? This is happening in a way that investors are saying, this is smart investing. If I am not looking, as Catherine Collins said on the panel yesterday, if I as an investor am not asking a drug company about whether they have sex disaggregated data coming out of their clinical trials, I'm risking a lawsuit from women if the drug uh, operates differently. If I, as an automobile company, am not testing women in the driver's seat, which, by the way, we didn't do until 2010, um, maybe I'm risking some real problems. So this is you know, the, the, the piece there, and again, the women and girls equality strategy at US Trust, the performance numbers last year, 360 basis points above the S&P 1500. So again, all of this is just to bookmark this part of the conversation, the market opportunity. Okay, so let's go, great, there's this market opportunity out there and, and how do we get there? So Justin, I'm gonna start with you because the Calvert Foundation has been a leader in poverty alleviation, a leader in finding organizations that are both um, good investments and making solid change. And yet you said, well, wait, what if we added gender? Is it adding gender? How did, how did that play out and what did it mean internally for your processes? Sure, uh, it certainly was uh, um, quite a bit of, of evolution internally. Um, if we're talking about that, it, it really galvanized uh, staff uh, internally to think across the organization, get teams together um, from, from risk management and investment originations and, and marketing and sales and all of that in, in, in some new ways to kind of think about how this works from both a portfolio and risk management perspective a, a, as well as um, an interesting opportunity that investors would really like to uh, engage in. And uh, I, I think that, that we really saw how and this is something that we could take from what we had seen as uh, having been done and demonstrated in certain sectors and try to bring this conversation to others. Uh, because really, gender is something that goes across all of the different uh, impact sectors that we work in. So in affordable housing and in small business and healthcare and uh, education and uh, fair trade and sustainable agriculture, uh, things like that. How can we really uh, have this as part of the, the conversation? And, and we did it, um, one, it really is an experiment to kind of see where it took us, but really with the belief that it would open up a number of different opportunities. And, and we didn't know exactly how we would do it, especially with, as I mentioned before, our interest in trying to do it more on the domestic front, where there were less kind of pure play women investment options, uh, so to speak, uh, but we really found that, that people were, were, were doing a lot uh, more than, than we understood. So one, it, it allowed us to kind of learn from them, but also uh, allowed us to have a conversation with everyone around this is a way to, to open up a number of different opportunities. And so we were really thrilled with the response that, that we saw, especially on the portfolio d development side domestically, and that we were able to get over 80% of the, the, the fund so far uh, d deployed domestically. And I think that we're really just starting to learn from that, right? This is all part of a, an ongoing conversation and uh, we'll, we'll get better. I, I think people will, will start to see other opportunities uh, when they have this focus. Mm -hmm. So Kristen, on the, on the internal side, you mentioned the importance of a champion. Can you talk about this process at IDB and, and how a champion makes a difference? 
Sure. Uh, the the Inter-American Development Bank uh, has kind of three different vice presidencies, one being the, the private sector that we think is, is key and crucial to development. We also have a, a sectors presidency. Within that, we have a group that just focuses on gender and diversity. So within our institution, we're, we're privileged to have a group of individuals who their main focus is gender and diversity. They're located throughout our borrowing member countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, and really are experts at the, the country level and on the subject matter of gender and diversity. Uh, our final is our, our vice presidency of countries who have specialists at the, the country level and, and gender on a country level and cultural level is very different. Even within certain countries like Peru or Colombia, when you look at some of the indigenous communities, gender is very different on, on that level as well. So I think IDB was lucky in the, the, the sense that we do have this large group that had a focus on gender and diversity. Um, we had a, an EVP somewhat a few years ago come, come um, into to power, Julie Katzman, who's really been a catalyst at driving women on the agenda for us externally and internally. And with that, the, there's been several initiatives that we've had. Um, first, IDB has several different groups working on many different things in several different countries. We, we took together and said, within the institution, how do we identify what are best practices, what are other people doing, and how do we cross-pollinize something that may be happening on the public sector with something we can take to the private sector. We also have had some institutional changes in, in looking at what is the balance of, of gender that we have internally. IDB really tries to walk the walk as far as what we do on energy efficiency or climate change, et cetera, and so we've really made an, an initiative for all of the, the staff member roles. Uh, we usually have panel, panel interviews, and we try to be more conscious. What's the gender balance? Not that we're, we're hitting quotas or anything else, but be cognizant of what is the gender balance on any given panel uh, within the, the bank, and trying to look at opportunities for, for women as mentors. We have a women's network within IDB that's been very helpful. And, and we've taken that across to our, our clients as well, that we, we do have the advantage of having this group that does focus on gender, but to work with different institutions, and we cover several different sectors, but for instance, we created a women in banking line that a lot of banks don't realize the, the opportunity of lending to women. And there's an educational process that goes along with that in, in helping them work with it, and it was amazing how a couple of the banks started this as pioneers, and now it's something that all of the banks realize, or a lot more of the banks in Latin America has realized that this is a value proposition, and there is training that goes along with that. So a lot of times we'll pair technical assistance with some sort of funding to allow them to deploy funds in a smart way. What's underlying this, if, as I listen to you, in the context of the panel yesterday and some of what um, Willie Foote from Root Capital shared, is at some level almost a warning label that I might put out, right? Which is to say there's an amazing business case for starting to be gender aware in your products and services and to develop um, gender inclusive op um, businesses and warning, it will come back and transform your organization, right? It, it is not a conversation that can only be had about what you do with your clients. Um, and it's really wonderful to see Willie, I think, talked about it as an excruciating and exhilarating journey of re-looking at Root Capital's organization. Um, so Ross, you, you've been on this journey. Did, it, did this realization change your process or did it change anything about how your, your whole system works or, or where to go? Yeah, I mean, I would say that um, for us, the cycle in which we work with an entrepreneur is uh, we have programs, we recruit for programs, we have, when we started to see that um, at least on a, on a company performance standpoint, it seemed Peter from Emory uh, is the guy who manages our data. Peter, it, the data seems to suggest, is that, is that the right, can I say that? <laughs> All right. Uh, the caveat of a researcher. The data, the data seems to suggest that women companies are outperforming, but we find, okay, well, we had, you know, 8% of applicants are women. So we say, okay, well, if we want better companies, then we want more women coming in the door. So we start to look at our recruitment process. And um, we find that 
the just the process of applying to a thing or pitching somebody is uh, women and men respond differently. Uh, men have nothing except an idea on paper and they say, I'm ready. A woman's been running a business for five years and say, I'm not ready yet. Um, this sounds great, but I'm just not there. And so our recruitment conversations with men are actually more like, like one-way marketing conversations. They're like, they're like, okay, I get it. Let me tell you about why you should accept me to your program. And our recruitment conversations with women are very much, um, especially if it's a great business, here is why we think you are ready for a program like this, even though you don't think you are ready. And so um, if you want a, and it, so yes, seeing results that got us very excited make, made us think about every step of how we work as an organization, including um, the, the very intake and how we talk to people that we might think about uh, wanting to work with in an inclusive way. Hmm, that's great. So that aspect, I think, transitions us from this internal piece to a question of personal leadership. Um, and I, I think there's a parallel session going on that um, is fabulous right now in a conversation about multilingual leadership. And to me, this provides an opportunity to talk about leaders who actually understand gender and finance as a multilingual leader. And in some sense, I think, Ross, what you're demonstrating is multilingual leadership, right? I'm able to think about my whole process and understand how men and women relate in, in their cultural context to it. Uh, so I'm gonna put you and Justin on the spot initially and say, as men who I see as gender inclusive or multilingual leaders, um, what's it like and, and do you have any advice or sort of reflection on that? Start. Um, interesting question. Uh, I think for, for me, it's, uh, it just seems m more natural um, since just uh, thinking about my, my background and certainly career path uh, when I was thinking about, when I was getting ready to uh, think about this panel, it's like, wow, I, I'd never thought about it before, but I've always worked for women-owned businesses or um, women-led organizations um, internationally and then uh, since getting more involved in uh, sustainable and impact investing um, more than a dozen years ago. And so it's just been, been part of it. And, uh, but one of the areas that I really do um, work in more now is the kind of the more traditional financial services industry and trying to bridge some of the gaps uh, there between that and impact investing. And uh, it's been really interesting and, and kind of shocking sometimes when you go, some of these conferences, you, you can count the number of people sometimes on one hand or two that are people of color. And maybe on one or two hands, the number of women. And I was just at one with one of your colleagues, Jackie, um, at uh, Merrill Lynch, who uh, we were sitting in the back of the room and I was like, like, this is a quite an interesting uh, conference. She said, this is nothing like it is in, in the bank. We're just talking about this is kind of an old boys network. And there wasn't one speaker uh, at this conference of had a couple hundred financial professionals, not one speaker was a woman. And so I think part of uh, what my role is in, in some of that responsibility is to, you know, just get involved in that conversation and, and, and just share that observation um, and, and how that, maybe some ideas on, on how uh, we, that conference and other venues and, and decision makings around that can, can be more inclusive. So that's certainly one thing. But I think more folks will really get involved once we continue to see that the data and the stories that continue to show that uh, involving women in decision making uh, is uh, um, more effective. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it's coming. Hopefully we can continue to um, help be a leader and, and make it come sooner because um, we all wish it had come a, a lot sooner th than it has. Um, but it is part of the understanding and, and, and let's continue to, to move the needle. Yeah, I would say, um, I, I would say that uh, First of all, everything he said. Second, uh, the most important thing I think that we've learned, and we've done a lot of things uh, poorly in Village Capital's history, the one thing that I think that we've um, 
I'm really proud of how we've been able to do is, is attention to detail and process. So for example, the reason why we have this data is because we set up a process three years ago that's, in, that's rigorous that means we can send data to people and they take it seriously versus, you know, X, Y, Z anecdote. And I think that um, that is something that women are particularly, I think, much better than men at uh, in general. And that is something that uh, organizations in the investment world are, are not particularly good at, I think, because they are, they are men run. And so I think that um, I, I mean, the smartest person I know in the world is my mom. My mom is, uh, if Anne, has, Anne knows my mom, my mom, attention to detail to process is my mom's thing. And if that's like the one thing that I inherited to my mom that made mm -hmm. me to be able to be a, uh, to, to work well with really incredible women leaders. I've worked with a lot of incredible women leaders as we've, as we've gone down this journey. I mean, we, ha we are, if you are at the plenary tonight, along with our partners, Chilton Capital and USAID and uh, the Sorensen Center, uh, we will be announcing a new fund that is run by my partner, Victoria Fram, a woman fund manager. I think a uh, woman makes a better fund manager for a fund like us because it requires, to do what we do well, requires specific attention to detail to process. And so I, I, I pull that out as one specific example where um, it is something that a lot of men leaders don't get and it makes it a really, um, a really difficult environment for women to work in when there's not uh, when, when people don't care about the process of how you, of how you get places. I, um, that's, that's just one example of where I feel like we've, we've, we've been effective. Mm, interesting. So, Kirsten, can you pick up on, Kristen, I'm sorry, can you pick up on the um, multilingual leadership piece just because you have an unusual opportunity with deep gender expertise in your organization in terms of what that has meant either for you personally or as you've seen um, in some sense, the, um, I, I don't want to necessarily say there have been epiphanies, but maybe there have been in terms of how the loan officers have been trained to understand gender. Yeah, so uh, working in Latin America, working in banking, there, there's been several times where I'm sitting in a room and I'm the only female. Um, I think for, for a lot of the, the women that do work in, in banking or in, in Latin America, that that's the case. I think part of it is bringing the awareness. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll use, um, you know, humor or something like, wow, you know, don't everyone stand in line for the women's restroom or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be that, that, that sometimes I think that there isn't the awareness. So I think that to the extent that you can bring that up, we, we try to, in working with companies, we try to do that via data and sometimes just awareness that, that even in, in speaking, sometimes examples, a whole speech could be given where it's he did this, you know, his whatever, and, and bringing the awareness to people of, you know, sometimes say he or she or, or throw in a, a female example. But as far as the, the, the training that we had at, at IDB, there are several uh, initiatives that we've taken and kind of broken out and tried to take across the, the various sectors that we work in. Climate change is one of them, gender and diversity is a, another. And for that, we, we've given our, our officers training and speaking with various companies and, and how to be aware of some of these issues, that whether it's you're working in an agribusiness and you have a lot of female workers and how what is the importance of having work-life balance can help you attract and maintain better talent and thinking about some things that maybe men don't think about, you know, a lactation room, for instance. And we've done that kind of in the organization and outside the organization and trying to help people that may be working on an infrastructure project try to think through, are there elements of gender that isn't, doesn't have to be the main focus of the project, it may be an expansion, it may be something else, but are there elements, ask the, the questions to see is there an opportunity for us to offer technical assistance to help educate the leadership team on that, on areas of, of gender both opportunistically um, from a market perspective or internally from an organization perspective to improve the organization, to help attract and maintain talent, and to bring the awareness in having those conversations of what is the mix of the team that you're working on because there have been enough studies that show that there's better innovation and competitiveness when you do have diverse teams and when you're creating that diverse, inclusive environment. Mm, thanks. So 
um, maybe to wrap this piece, I, I hope you have heard, as each of you probably are out there thinking about your own leadership and the opportunities, um, that there is a, a real business case here, but you have to make it. Just going back to the beginning, all of us have said in different ways, um, things shift when the business case is made. There's an aspect where you do need yourself to step up as a leader and or to identify other leaders with you, right? And uh, around this room, there's a set of folks doing that. Um, and I think, again, underlying this multilingual leadership, um, we didn't talk about it all that much here, but I strongly believe that part of this is also the ecosystem aspect of things. So I want to give a shout out to Oxfam and WISE that's in the room because of their work and sort of saying it is about um, funding, it is about technical assistance, but it's also about the policy advocacy piece. Um, and so bringing all of that together. We can go anywhere you want in the Q&A on any of this stuff. Um, so with that, over to you all, and let's continue the conversation. I think we need to give one of these out here. All right. Hi, my name is MJ Doctors. I work with um, Sama Source and I'm heading up a new venture there and so have been um, delving into the world of venture capital and all sorts of various funding um, possibilities. And so one thing that I, I struggle with a little bit and be curious to get your perspective um, is on this tension that I see between going, okay, well, women are what, 40% plus le less likely to get funding from sort of the establishment. Let's maybe go off and form our own club or, or let's go to sort of women-led, women-only uh, investment uh, uh, sort of institutions versus, well, let's actually recognize that we are excluded from the establishment and let's try and change that establishment from within. And I, I see sort of pros and cons on both sides and would just be curious to get some of your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. I, it's, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, and we've, we've talked and published a lot of our numbers around women and every time an article like Jackie's, which you should uh, read, comes out, um, somebody comes to us and says, this is great. Can we do a women-only village capital? That's, we probably got asked that question more often than any other. And we, first time it happened, we go to our, our women entrepreneurs, our alumni, and say, how would you think differently? Um, w would you apply if we did the same thing that you came to, but it was women-only? And um, there are a subset who say yes, but most of them say no. They say, listen, I, I'm going to need to be competitive in a world that is biased against me um, at some point. And it seems to be kind of delaying the inevitable. If I were to go to a women-only accelerator, what I, what I really liked about this process is it um, looked just like the day-to-day -day world, except for this one bias that really screws me over was removed from it. So, you know, changing the larger system on our very small subset of the larger venture capital system was more important than, you know, setting up a parallel universe that our women entrepreneurs think is a half a bridge to nowhere. Yeah. I'll just say as a piece of this, because we get the question a lot as well, um, I think it can be a false dichotomy, right? So I like to say yes to both. Right? I think that we need um, gender specific um, opportunities. There are lessons that are learned from women focused incubators that then can get spread across the entire industry. There are fabulous funding organizations, um, Ostia in the room, um, and others who because of their focus on women entrepreneurs have enabled other organizations to see what they would have otherwise missed. Um, and we need to change the system. So yes, both. Over here. Hi, Jenny Harms, I'm with the Hitachi Foundation. I just wanted to add a comment to this conversation. We work with Village Capital um, with a number of their cohorts in the United States and what's been really interesting to me, particularly this year with the healthcare cohort, is there is a woman in there who is making a breast pump for women who are gonna be able to, to work and not have this cumbersome breast pump. And the men in the room don't get it. And so I think to your question, it's the opportunity for her to educate the male entrepreneurs in the room and the male investors, but it's also an opportunity for her to learn how she needs to communicate in different ways depending on her, um, her audience and her situation. But it's a really, really interesting dynamic. So I think men and women have to stay in the room together to keep mo moving forward. Interesting.
Sure. the translatability of this issue to other aspects of diversity. So do your funds, do you see market opportunities um, across race, across sexual orientation, uh, ability, class, faith? Are these other areas that you're looking at or is gender more important? Mm -hmm. We, at, at IDB, we, we have a group that, that's called our Gender Diversity Group, and we, we look at both of them and approach both of them very similarly. Um, diversity, you know, either Afro-descendants or working with indigenous people is something that, that we need to think about, and, and we take an approach where there's several different levels that we're working at at the same time. One of them is the, the ecosystem. We, we start as early as, as looking at education and making sure that education is reaching people, that there's different approaches to... Uh, tapping into an indigenous community and trying to bring them into mainstream. There's different approaches to bringing in women. Women in STEM is something that, that, that we work on a lot, trying to make sure that there's scholarship or student loan opportunities for groups that, that may not have the same access, trying to make sure that they're incorporated. For, for instance, in, in education, it's, it's very important when bringing people from indigenous communities into, if they go to, to a university or a school that's out of their main area, that they're, they're able to be absorbed. So I think everything from the ecosystem, looking at the, the, the policies on the public side to make sure that, that both gender and diversity, including kind of indigenous people, diverse populations, Afro-descendants, et cetera, are included. And having the conversation, both educating people, our, our investment officers, the, the, the people on the front line having conversations with companies, to have that conversation. Have you looked at your organization that both from a gender perspective and other diverse populations, it's important to have that representation and here's why. And we walk through them and, and show them data and start them thinking about not only from a business perspective, but from uh, a human resources perspective, have you taken this into account and make funding available to be able to do that, that we have, for, for instance, lines that we specifically give to banks to be able to online to women or diverse companies and try to take that through the, the whole ecosystem from educating people to providing mentors to having people aware of the situation and, and to be able to have those conversations. Yeah, and I would just add, um, you know, being in a very diverse organization at Calvert Foundation, whether it's women-led, but also diversity in terms of language and having multilingual leadership in terms of having financial and social impact and, and other uh, chops uh, amongst our staff, that it, it, it is really important internally for, for us as well. Um, and, and we've always wanted to, uh, for, for many years, gathered our, our internal metrics and shared that uh, with other like organizations in, in our space because mm -hmm. we think that's important to our success, uh, to one of the points that's uh, been mentioned a couple of times. We often have investors visiting us, financial services firms, to kind of understand us, underwrite us, things like that. And one of the ways that w we have a, a lot of really interesting and important conversations is showing them our lactation room, right, as we're going around around the office. So it, it's it's something that we have, have really internalized, uh, but we are collecting a lot more uh, overall diversity metrics in terms of uh, populations of color and indigenous populations, um, because we do think overall, not just on the gender side, but but equal opportunity is really important and necessary for us to have better businesses, better companies, et cetera. Yeah, I, I, the only thing I would add is um, similar to the way applying for things has an implicit bias against women. I'm looking, and if it, it is a topic that we're really interested in, there's a panel that uh, I'll be on at 245 with Frida Kapor Klein, who's mm -hmm. done a ton of work in particularly uh, Latin American and, or Lat African American and Latino representation, is what I meant to mm -hmm. say, um, in the tech startup world. Mm -hmm. And things like work for a very low salary and get all this equity is great if you're a 24 year old with no kids, if you have student debt or, um, kids who can't eat equity, uh, it's not so great. And so there are things that are common practices that everybody does that exclude women from investment pipelines, ex exclude people with kids from startups. Like there, and um, there will be a long conversation about that that would love to have you be a part of. It's interesting just to add from the public markets standpoint, because I, I think what you heard is a resounding yes, right? A resounding yes that there, there is um, 
these things are, are uh, similar in different ways, so to speak. But we, like we have a women and girls equality strategy, we have what we call a human rights and recognition strategy that looks at how companies are thoughtful at engaging um, across diversity in terms of sexual orientation and, and race. And again, we think that that means that the companies are better long-term investments. Hello, my name is John Lanthier. Uh, I also work for Somasource. We have a lactation room, by the way. So <laughs> it's, um, all of you have sort of alluded to this, but I was curious to get maybe a deeper dive on how you see uh, this issue of gender uh, changing depending on what geography you're in. You know, we give digital work uh, to women overseas and also do ICT training here in the United States. And we're finding it's, it's a very different story to give a job to a woman in a village in India where women are not traditional breadwinners and where some aren't even allowed to work, where we have to find partners who will, you know, gather up all the men in the village and get an agreement from them to allow, you know, the women there to actually go and, and earn a living. Uh, it, it's very different from like trying to um, help a woman, say, in the Bayview district of San Francisco support herself, where she's expected to work, but she's a single mother and is also trying to raise three kids and can't work during, you know, typical office hours. So just like how gender, I guess, like changes depending on geography, like a little bit of comment on that. So I, I think the answer is yes, and one of the pieces that I will um, put out again to one of the leading organizations in this space, the Women's, Women's World Banking, who had one of the first women-focused equity funds in microfinance, is that their founder will say the reason Women World, Bank Women World Banking is successful is because they realized that what it was going to be like in Haiti was not what it was going to be like in the Ivory Coast. And they let women in each geography create a appropriate construct and, and set of operations for that particular culture. So I think it's a hugely important piece. We can obviously learn across cultures, but, but we have to, uh, to respect the differences. Yeah, uh, and certainly we've seen that at Calvert Foundation and, and in impact investing more, more broadly across the different sectors and domestic and in many different uh, types of cultures and internationally that there, there are a lot of other uh, elements that, that really need to be factored in to, to make sure that, that the strategies are appropriate and, and inclusive and, and there's really strong uh, buy-in. It is not something where uh, we can walk in with what we think of as an appropriate gender uh, inclusive strategy strategy and, and say this is uh, what we think that, that we should see and, and what we expect. It's really looking at the conditions on, on the ground and, and where communities and, and organizations and businesses are, uh, kind of seeing where, where that is and, and just having a conversation about uh, you know, how, how it is today, what are some of the barriers, what are the challenges, making sure women are at that table too, um, and then seeing how we, we can improve uh, together. Um, we're not coming in with a development strategy. That is not uh, our approach. We want to know what the, the, the needs are there and see how we can support them um, and, and just uh, you know continue to work and, and have the conversation together around gender too. Yeah, and, and at the Inter-American Development Bank, we, we do have gender and diversity specialists that, that cover the various countries. And even within a country, it can be drastically different in the various indigenous communities. So we're always incorporating that, that knowledge and expertise that we have specialists that, that are just focused on that living in the country as experts of that country and working on any given project project, that if, if it's a company and they're, they're you know, national or that they, they, they want to go you know, from a regional to a more national level, to take those type of things into account, of course, is, is very important that it is very different from country to country and a lot of times even within countries. And then we also have the, the advantage that I believe IDB has almost 50 different countries represented within the organization. So we're, we're able to have that conversation tapping into to, to someone on a team that's from you know, several different countries talking about the, the problem or having that conversation even within the, the organization. Okay. So I'm realizing we probably should wrap here and let you all get to your next sessions, but I did um, want to ask the, the panelists, just as the conversation has evolved, um, for a summary comment, um, potentially a tweetable comment if you want, um, just in terms of how you see the, the gender capitalism opportunity um, both now and in the future. So any 
you don't, we don't have to go in any order, but. How many characters do we get now? It used to be about 140 or 145. Uh, um, well, I, I think that there's, uh, I'm glad so many people are here and part of this conversation. Uh, thanks to Jackie and the other folks here. Um, let, let's continue to, to work together. A lot of resources from Jackie's book and, and um, article and Center for Social Innovation Review and all that, that I hope you check out. I know US CIF has a, a, a one pager really about, uh, in, for financial professionals, really about investing with a gender lens that, that comes out, uh, I think, in a couple weeks. Uh, so be on the, the lookout for that. Uh, but in terms of a, a closing a tweetable comment, uh, maybe uh, in, in the vein of moving from the, the why, which I think a lot of us in this industry understand why this is important, and our understanding will, will continue to deepen, but a move to the how, um, a little self-serving but uh, on the how, but maybe something uh, along the lines of invest with a gender lens today at win-win. Uh, that's our, our women's uh, initiative and uh, all types of investors, whether it's $20 online or through your brokerage account or whatever uh, you're interested um, in, in contributing to this, there, there is an action step there on, on the investment front um, and, and there are others out there. So continue to explore um, and thanks. Yeah, I, I would um, I would sum it up and say, uh, ask yourself why specifically is gender capitalism important to you, and what specific problem is standing in the way of the reason why it's important to you. So for us, um, in my day job, I mean, there there are all kinds of ideological social justice reasons why gender capitalism is important. But in the things that I get measured on every day, um, if we are not proactive about giving women an equal shot to men, we are actively pursuing a less profitable investment strategy. And that is a bad thing. So what is standing in the way of more women in our accelerator cohorts is something we think a lot about, for example. So um, we don't just do gender capitalism to do it. We do it because if we don't do it, we are, act we are intentionally making uh, bad decisions. And so I would, uh, I would ask yourself that same question and ask it from a pragmatic angle and you can start to think about the two or three things that you can do when you leave this room. Yeah, I think um, the, the inclusion of women is, is essential for developmental impact and, and also critical for business, competitiveness, innovation, and, and success. Um, IDB has some great examples. We, we, for the private sector, recently rolled out an app that you can find on the, the app store. We, we also have a, a private sector blog and also a gender diversity blog. Our, our most recent entry is um, STEM minus women equals a private sector problem. Great. And I guess I would say, so for me, gender capitalism is a proven market opportunity and it's an emerging practice. Um, so proven market, market opportunity, you, you just take a look at it and see where does it fit for your particular situation. But the emerging practice piece is really an invitation for you to join the community, to not feel like you have to figure it all out now, but just start. Start with something. Start with one piece. Don't feel like it has to be a holistic. And then um, there are so many different experts here and in this room. So raise your hand if you have questions. And thank you, thank you. Oh, last thing. Um, there is a group of practitioners um, in this space joining together in about two weeks for something called Convergence. It's hosted by the Criterion Institute, which has been a leader in this space for a long time. And if you want to know more about that, um, see me or Suzanne Beagle or someone. Thanks.